Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. While NASA is planning to put four astronauts on the lunar surface full-time in the near future, the European Space Agency is planning to put 144 astronauts on the moon for the long term. Working in conjunction with one of the preeminent architectural firms in Europe, NASA doesn't just have a plan for a lunar habitat, but a lunar habitat master plan. All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. I was talking to one of my team members last night about Artemis, about Lunar Starship and uh, NASA's timetable and how unrealistic the whole thing is. The notion that we're going to be able to land human beings on the lunar surface with Lunar Starship in September of 2026. I'm not going to get into all the details as to why I feel that that's impossible. I've got some links at the end of this video if you're interested in checking that out. But one of the biggest problems that we have with Artemis, when I say we, of course, I've got a team of folks here uh, at the Angry Astronaut who help me with my content and contribute a lot when it comes to knowledge, when it comes to ideas. And one of the biggest issues that Artemis has is that no clear long-term objective has actually been established. Sure, we talk about going to the moon to stay, but what does that actually mean? What does that actually look like? How many people do we want to have on the moon to stay? What are these people going to be doing? Scientific research? Mining? Or establishing a new place for the human race to live? I mean, what is the long-term objective? NASA really doesn't lay that out very well. Instead, they talk about Artemis 3 and a couple astronauts. They talk about Artemis 4, Artemis 5, and perhaps setting up a small-scale habitat, but they don't really get into what comes next. We know a lot about what kind of hardware we're going to be using to get there, but not what we intend to do once we get there. Now, ESA, on the other hand, has a pretty clear objective in mind, at least in my opinion. And they've been rolling out a number of moon habitat master plans over the last several years. What does that mean? Well, it is the long-term objective, what ESA would like to accomplish on the moon eventually, what the end game is for Artemis and our overall initiative to get to the moon to stay. It's pretty detailed, and it's pretty damn ambitious. And of course, I really like ambitious. So how ambitious are we talking? Well, how about 144 astronauts on the moon full-time, not just four? And this is not something that is just a vague promise, something that they say they would like to do eventually. Not sure exactly how it's going to be accomplished, but yeah, we would like to have a lunar town with 144 astronauts. Actually, some very specific plans have been laid out with the help of some very, very good architectural firms in Europe. And one of the most impressive is Hassel's recent Lunar Habitat Master Plan. And it involves inflatable habitats. That's something I've always been very fond of. 3D printed regolith and a lot of other things that will allow astronauts to live on the moon safely and comfortably for the long term. When people criticize Elon Musk's plans to live long term on Mars, few people really consider just how much more difficult it's going to be to live on the moon. Yeah, Mars doesn't have much of an atmosphere, but it has an atmosphere. And that makes a big difference when we're talking about temperature, when we're talking about protection from radiation. There are so many things that Mars's incredibly thin atmosphere does for the surface of that planet that makes it a lot more hospitable than the surface of our natural 
external satellite. Living on the surface of the moon is going to be beyond challenging. It is continuously bombarded by solar radiation and cosmic rays, and with no magnetic field, it's practically the same as being in interplanetary space. And it gets worse than that. As I suggested before, the temperatures vary wildly. During their operable period on the Martian surface, the Viking landers detected temperatures ranging anywhere from negative 17.2 degrees Celsius to negative 107 degrees Celsius. And by the way, that's not at the equator. At the Martian equator, you can have temperatures as high as 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Right. On the moon, things are radically different. When exposed to the sun's full power at the equator, you're talking temperatures as high as 120 degrees Celsius, substantially higher than the boiling point of water. But at the lunar south pole, things can get insanely cold. There are regions of the lunar south pole that have never seen the sun with temperatures that have been measured as low as minus 250 degrees Celsius, making it actually the coldest temperature that has ever been measured anywhere in the solar system. Now think about that for a moment. Minus 250 degrees Celsius as opposed to a minus 107 degrees Celsius on Mars. We are going to be facing some enormous challenges trying to survive on the moon. And the best way to do that is to shelter ourselves from this environment as much as possible insulate ourselves with a nice layer of lunar regolith preferably 3d printed regolith but it's more complicated than just taking a bunch of regolith and tossing it on top of the habitat because lunar regolith is very abrasive and is also statically charged it could actually be dangerous to the structural integrity of a lunar base so the way that Hassel plans to do this is to use a interlocking system of building blocks made out of lunar regolith concrete 3d printed concrete that is reinforced by inflatable girders and these interlocking hexagonal building blocks are not in direct contact with the inflatable modules beneath it the building blocks are suspended over the inflatable modules perhaps lightly touching them but that's it so it still provides all of the insulation and radiation protection that you need without any abrasive damage to the structure of the modules beneath the regolith a very interesting idea and by the way somebody might ask well why not just construct the whole base out of 3d printed regolith instead of using inflatable habitats imported from earth well because lunar regolith is not only abrasive it's hazardous to your health if you were to have 3d printed concrete beneath your feet all the time there's a good chance the stuff would start scraping up beneath the soles of your feet and eventually find its way into the atmosphere and into your lungs. This stuff is very hazardous and proved to be quite a challenge for the astronauts who tracked the stuff into the Apollo capsules and were plagued with the stuff until they returned home. And since these astronauts are not going to be returning home for months or perhaps even years, you really need to have a long-term plan to mitigate this sort of stuff and especially to make sure that anything you build out of it does not come into direct contact with pressurized modules. So the idea is to use a combination of 3D printed regolith in these interlocking building blocks and inflatable habitats beneath. Hassel have been big fans of inflatable habitats for a very long time, having proposed using them for their Martian habitat as well a few years ago. Another advantage is the fact that you can have a pressurized module insulated from the 3D printed structure, providing essentially a double walled enclosure for the astronauts, protecting them from the environment outside. Meaning that you have two layers of protection against the pressure differential 
differential against the radiation and against the temperature as opposed to just one and as we have seen with the inflatable habitats that Sierra Space has been introducing lately inflatable modules are both lightweight and compact and very large habitats can be fit inside small conventional rockets for example the Vulcan Centaur and its five meter fairing is more than large enough to accommodate the standard Sierra Space Life module which is 300 cubic meters in size and Sierra Space also has a larger version that's over 1400 cubic meters worth of pressurized volume and that can fit inside the 7 meter fairing of New Glenn and could definitely fit inside the fairing of Starship. So what you have here is a solution that provides all of the protection that you need and a large amount of volume for a very sizable lunar population and Hassel has lots and lots of different types of modules included in their overall design for their habitat master plan. The large inflatable modules allow for sizable living spaces. You don't have to be in these small claustrophobic little modules like you are on the ISS. Instead, living spaces can be spacious. Even the individual quarters can be relatively spacious compared to what space station astronauts have for themselves right now, which is little more than a tiny little coffin when it comes right down to it. On top of that, this design design includes social spaces that make it feel less like a base and more like a city, like restaurants and sports arenas and enriching earth-based environments like huge greenhouses. This is a fundamental step up in lunar habitats, an ambitious plan to put at least 144 astronauts on the moon full time, with the capability of expanding considerably beyond that because these are modular interlocking habitats. And the location for the base is pretty good too. The intention is to put it at the edge of Shackleton Crater, where there is generally a non stop supply of solar energy. Maybe not direct sunlight, but no lunar night to speak of. So the lunar south pole is not only advantageous because of its water ice, it's advantageous because of its non-stop access to solar energy. As I said before, not direct solar energy, but still enough of it to provide an ongoing source of power. So nuclear reactors may not be quite as necessary for this type of base. And given the recent discoveries made by the Chandrayaan-3 lander. That is to say, the discoveries whereby the temperatures tend to become a lot more moderate, just a few centimeters beneath the surface. This suggests that a 3D printed regolith enclosure might be a lot easier to heat than something on the surface of the moon. Therefore, the power requirements might even be less drastic than we might have been thinking to begin with. I still feel that nuclear reactors are going to be an important feature of a lunar base, but this particular city does not seem to need them. Its design incorporates some very large solar panels that stick up from a variety of different locations throughout the town, and it seems to be enough to provide the necessary energy for the base itself, as long as it's completely insulated from the lunar environment above by this 3D printed regolith. It's a very innovative solution and it's very exciting that the European Space Agency are the ones putting this forward and not NASA. It suggests that Europe at least have very detailed plans on what they want us to be doing on the moon and I love their ambition. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. It's very important to the future of my channel. And also please check the description for various ways to support my channel, especially on Patreon, still working towards getting to that 1% level, 1% of my subscribers being Patreon supporters. If that were to happen, it will change everything about what I can do with this channel. But obviously I value every last viewer who tunes into my content. Thanks again, and as always, stay angry about space.